Welcome to the Module 3 of the book, Nigerian Peoples and Culture. This material is from National Open University of Nigeria. My name is Dan Asukwo, your instructor. If you are a noun student or from any other universities, this will be very useful for you. Do well to share with others as well as on your study groups. If this is your first time of coming across our videos, why not do well to subscribe, like, comment, and share for others, too, to benefit. Module 3. Introduction. This module is made up of five zero five study units, see below. However, you should always bear in mind that although the study units are autonomous, they are interconnected as well. The overall aim purpose of this module 202 is to help you understand and have a sound knowledge of the concepts of functional education, national economy, religion, social justice, and rights of citizens in Nigeria. Unit 1. A Historical Analysis of Education and National Development in Nigeria Unit 2 A Historical Analysis of Economy and National Development in Nigeria Unit 3 A Historical Analysis of Religion and National Development in Nigeria Unit 4 A Historical Analysis of Moral and Sociopolitical Rights of Citizens in Nigeria Unit 5 A Historical Analysis of Social Justice and National Development in Nigeria Unit 1 a Historical Analysis of Education and National Development in Nigeria 1.0 Introduction This study unit introduces you to the relationship between education and national development from a historical perspective. It will focus mainly on the evolution of the Nigerian educational system from pre-colonial times to the year 2000. 2.0 Objectives At the end of this unit, you should be able to 1. Explain what education actually means to Describe the historical tie between education and national development. 3. Discuss the Nigerian educational system before and after independence. And 4. Evaluate the Nigerian educational system of today, etc. 3.0 Main Content 3.1 Education and National Development in History You should always remember that the strong relationship between education and development cannot be overemphasized. We can even say with confidence that education is to a nation what the mind is to the body. This is not only true for Nigeria alone, but is a fact worldwide. Even in ancient Greece, best known as the cradle of Western scholarship, education was the backbone or a searchlight boomed on society. In ancient Greece, for instance, education was a standard bearer and a blender of minds, behavior and cherished values. Greek social order and institutions were centered on the philosophy of great educationists of the kind of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. However, education also followed the life cycle system. Ono of Baidido, 1995, puts it better in this way. The journey of reason and Western learning from the ancient, through the classical to the modern world, are both eventful and checkered. They were exorcised by the medieval church of perceived traces of heresy and tinted with Christianity. They experienced a rebirth in the Renaissance of the 15th and 16th centuries and in turn gave birth to the Enlightenment in which educational structures were modernized. Even in Europe, although modern educationist forms were taken afield by the missionaries and various agents of imperialism, they nonetheless successfully engendered the Industrial Revolution and breathtaking development. But what happened in the Nigerian case? Self-assessment exercise. Use your own words to describe the historical link between education and national development of Nigeria. 3.2. Education and National Development in Nigeria It is obvious that the type and level of education have to be in line with the needs of society. History tells us that this worldwide fact is not in line with the Nigerian situation. Self-Assessment Exercise Discuss the relationship between education and national development in Nigeria. 3. 2.1 Stage 1 Nigerian Education in Pre-Colonial Times In pre-colonial era, most Nigerian communities were small, largely rural, and self-sufficient. Not only that, the system of education was informal and non-literate, it was not specialized at all. Education in colonial Nigeria was nothing more than schooling. Before independence, Nigerians were schooled to accept the society designed for them by the colonialists. This seriously contradicts Jane F. Doyle's understanding of education. According to her, education must engender in the individual a disposition of personal autonomy, responsibility, and a mastery of relevant forms of life, thought, and action. A good education should be free from moral indoctrination. 
but rich in moral training. Education indefensibly becomes indoctrination when a person is indoctrinated under the presence of being educated. Doyle, 1973. Self-assessment exercise. How would you describe Nigerian education in pre-colonial times? 3. 2.2. Stage 2. Nigerian education after independence. As stated earlier, the type and level of education have to be in line with the needs of the society. So as soon as Nigeria became independent, the functional inadequacies of education in the nation's schools became glaring as well. As a republic, Nigerian government became a complex and a complicated one. Therefore, the need to fashion out an educational system that would fit the new mood and the development needs of the nation became obvious and pressing. For instance, the government needed a good number of qualified individuals in almost every sector. Self-assessment exercise. Describe the Nigerian education system after independence. 3.3. The 1969 National Conference on Education. The year 1969 witnessed the first independent national educational conference on curriculum development in Nigeria. The Nigerian Educational Council organized it. The overall aim of the conference was to set a new policy of education for Nigeria. For that reason, it was not limited only to experts and professionals. It was a conference of the people of Nigeria. It was made up of representatives drawn from a cross-section of interest groups such as trade unions, farmers' unions, religious bodies, women's organizations, teachers' association, university teachers and administrators, professional organizations and ministry officials. One of the conference's main tasks was to review old goals and identify new national goals for Nigerians' education. The findings and decision of the 1969 conference became the cornerstone in the formulation of a national policy on education in 1977. These are some basic tenets. The inculcation of the right type of values and attitudes for the survival of the individual and the Nigerian society. The training of the mind in the understanding of the world around and the acquisition of appropriate skills, abilities both mental and physical as equipment for the individual to live in and contribute to the development of his society. The success of the National Policy on Education of 1977 was unprecedented. Available statistics indicate a tremendous expansion in the country's educational system, both in terms of number and variety of relevant institutions. According to Emoji, 1999, the enrollments in schools as at December 1996 were as follows. 37 universities with a student enrollment of 236, 261. Specialized technological institutions with enrollment of about 2,161 students. 45 polytechnics with student enrollment of 140, 953 students. 62 colleges of education with a total student enrollment of 89, 242. 7,222 secondary and technical schools with student population of 4,503,552. 48, 242 primary schools with a total enrollment of 16,761,519. Self-assessment exercise. Discuss the 1969 National Conference on Education. 3.4. Is Nigerian education system a failure? The answer to this question from a historical perspective cannot be a fixed one. History being a process, some scholars advocate the no answer while others advocate the yes option. Self-assessment exercise. Is the Nigerian education system a failure? 3. 4.1 The no answer primary and secondary levels. In 1976, the Nigerian government introduced the Universal Basic Education Program, UBE, this favored the increase of the number of schools along with an impressive increase in enrollment. By December 1996, primary schools' enrollment figure was about 17 million. In the south and parts of the Middle Belt regions, over 90% enrollment of children of school age was recorded. Emoji 1999. But according to Emoji, enrollment and transition rate from primary to secondary schools was still very low in a country with a population of over 100 million people as at that time, the tertiary level. In 1981, the tertiary education witnessed a tremendous improvement with the adoption of the 6334 system. This system was the making of Shigari's administration. The main aim was to train Nigerians that would lead the country on the part of industrial and technological advancement. 
The 6334 system was very much welcomed by many Nigerian scholars. To accomplish this goal, the government decided to increase the federal universities from 13 to 21, out of which nine universities of technologies were established and located in the main geopolitical zones. Self-assessment exercise. Discuss the no answer of the question, is the Nigerian education system a failure? 3. 4.2. The yes answer. For some scholars, the Nigerian educational system has been a failure. They claim that the theoretical frame under which these programs were cultivated was perfect on paper, but the government lacked the will, the ways, and the materials to see them through. At least two reasons have been put forward by them. The cultural conflict. According to GNU Azuigwe, 1989, one of the dominant factors that slows down the growth and productivity of the Nigerian education system is the persistent conflict between foreign intellectual traditions and the African tradition. The result is that the educated Nigerian is thrown into the morass of moral and intellectual confusion. He has neither assimilated the Christian or Islamic traditions fully nor abandoned the Nigerian varied traditions. The Nigerian factor. According to the scholars of the Yes Answer, one of the major reasons for the failure of the Nigeria education system is that of the Nigerian factors. It is unfortunate that many of those who established the Nigerian educational facilities did it for monetary purpose. The end use of these facilities had never been their intention. They were concerned only with accruable monetary rewards through fat contract settlements. The consequences nowadays are the production of graduates who carry certificates without the knowledge. They constitute a great danger to the society. Indeed, they have acquired nothing and they have nothing to lose. Self-assessment exercise. Discuss the yes answer of the question. Is the Nigerian education system a failure? Three. Five. Which way forward? As seen earlier, it is not easy to say with accuracy the exact period when the standard of education started to decline in Nigeria. It is also obvious that there have been some successes and failures. Since failure seems to be higher than successes, my aim in this section is to see what to do about it. These following are some policies the Nigerian education system needs to pursue. O oh, private schools should regain their autonomy. O oh, government-owned schools should be privatized. Oh, the government should content itself solely with education policy-making. Oh, government policies must be made to ensure that the well-known paradigms for measuring school standards are maintained. Oh, government should carry out a clean inventory of existing and private schools with the view to separating the chaffs from the seeds. Self-assessment exercise. Do you have any recommendation for the Nigerian education system? 4.0 Conclusion this study dealt with the analysis and understanding of the relationship between education and national development in Nigeria. The historical perspectives have been the main focus. 5.0 Summary In this study unit, I introduced you to the analysis and understanding of the relationship between education and national development in Nigeria from a historical point of view. Therefore, at the end of this unit, you are expected to explain what education actually means. Describe the historical tie between education and national development in Nigeria. Discuss the Nigerian educational system before and after independence. Evaluate the Nigerian educational system of today, etc. 6.0 Tutor Marked Assignment. Discuss this statement. The type and level of education have to be in line with the needs of society. To subscribe, like, comment, and share for others, too, to benefit. Unit 2. A Historical Analysis of Economy and National Development in Nigeria 1.0 Introduction This study unit introduces you to the relationship between economy and national development. The main focus is on the development of Nigeria's economy from pre-colonial times down to the year 2000. 2.0 Objectives At the end of this unit, you should able to Explain about the evolution of the Nigerian economy. Describe the relationship between economy and national development. Discuss the Nigerian economic system before and after independence. Evaluate the Nigerian economic system of today, etc. 3.0 Main Content 3.1 Overview of the National Economy of Nigeria Before independence, Nigeria could be called a powerful economic nation. 
Here is a country made up of land covering 98.321 million hectares, of which about 74.036 million hectares are arable. Nigeria was also one of the leading countries in agriculture, thanks to the good quality of its soil, good heat, and adequate moisture. But what still remains of immense importance to the Nigerian economy is her huge population. And the Nigerian population has the record to increase astronomically. Only between 1952 and 1991, the Nigerian population increased from 31.1 million to 88.5 million. Currently, population estimates put Nigeria's figure at 140 million, 2006. In 1990, the World Bank ranked Nigeria the seventh most populous country in the world, after China, India, USA, Indonesia, Brazil, and Japan. Before independence, agriculture accounted for over 50% of the gross domestic product, GDP, of Nigeria. Again, about three-quarters of the Nigerian population were engaged fully either in agriculture or agriculture-related activities. Cedar, iroko, and walnut are very much found in the mangrove and rainforest. Within the savanna, cocoa, rubber, palm produce, kola nut, and arable crops such as yam, cassava, maize, and citrus are generated. It is also easier in the Nigeria's grassland to raise cattle and other dairy products. This is also true with the cultivation of grains like guinea corn, millet, rice, cotton, groundnuts, beans, and other leguminous crops. Besides agriculture, there are some very important mineral deposits as well. These mineral deposits are scattered almost all over the country. In the west, for instance, we have the alluvial gold deposits, while there is tin in the north. The east is the center of coal. Edo Delta, Rivers, Emo Abia, and Cross River and Aqua Ibom states share the lion's part of petroleum products. Iron, brass, and bronze are found in Lokoja. Although scattered, limestone, kaolin, diatomite, and clay are found in abundance in Nigeria. Self-assessment exercise. Use your own words to describe the Nigerian economy before independence. 3.2. The structure of economic activities in Nigeria. Although most Nigerians are engaged in agriculture or agriculture-related activities, economists say there are at least 18 activity sectors of the Nigerian economy. These include agriculture, livestock, forestry, fishing, crude petroleum, mining and quarrying, manufacturing utilities, building and construction, transport, communication, wholesale and retail trade, hotels and restaurants, finance and insurance, real estate and business service, housing, producers of government services, and community social and personal services. As already mentioned, agricultural activities are spread all over the Federation. In the year 1960 or thereabouts, agriculture absorbed over 75% of the workforce, while industry and other sectors together employed the rest. Therefore, in contributing to the Nigerian GDP, agriculture was the leading sector. With respect to that, Nigeria enjoyed the modest tag of a middle-income country. However, from the period 1980 till date, GNP per capita dropped. This situation, coupled with the deteriorating social services, continuous high rates of inflation, declining productivity and high rates of unemployment, have made the average Nigerian poor by all standards. Self-assessment exercise. What are the sectors of the Nigerian economy that you know? 3.3. Is Nigeria economically self-reliant? A nation is said to be self-reliant when her citizens depend largely on her human and material resources for most of their basic needs. In other words, self-reliance as a national development strategy usually refers to a nation's determination to rely on the utilization of domestic resources to produce most of her required goods and services. As far as Nigeria is concerned, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to claim that she is economically self-reliant. Here is a country where the economic underdevelopment is so obvious, almost all the economic indicators are on the negative side. Low capacity utilization in industries, primitive and abandoned agriculture, debt problems, inflation, balance of payments crisis, unemployment and underemployment, malnutrition and misdirection of resources. Also, the overdependence on oil and other imported inputs are serious problems in the Nigerian economy. This simply shows that Nigeria for now is not economically self-reliant. On the contrary, a nation is said to be economically self-reliant when there are 
heavy reliance on domestic resources for the production of required goods and services, a reduced dependence on outsiders for the supply of required goods and services, an active use of international trade policy instrument for controlling imports, and domestic prices. Those are relatively higher than they would otherwise have been in the absence of development strategies of self-reliance. However, you should always remember that achieving self-reliance is a perpetual task. Self-reliance is a process that needs to be sustained. That is why even when a country is called self-reliant, it is always very necessary to identify and examine likely factors which enhance a country's economic self-reliance capabilities on a consistent basis. In the case of Nigeria, for instance, agriculture, capital, technology, energy, and industrialization are the key aspects of the economy. Self-assessment exercise. Is Nigeria economically self-reliant? 3.4 Major Problems of the Nigerian Economy These days, Nigeria is a country of paradox. Nigeria is regarded as a poor country despite the abundance of human and natural resources. This is obvious when we look at the Standard of Living Index as mentioned earlier. The economic situation of Nigeria today is negatively different from that of the past. In the year 1970, for instance, Nigeria was self-sufficient in food production and the economy was somehow balanced. But the relegation of agriculture to the second rank, to the benefit of the so-called oil boom, has put Nigerian economy in a very complex situation. The consequence is that almost all the non-oil sectors of the economy have become stagnant. Worse still, revenues accruing from crude oil sales are mismanaged. This situation has led to some serious problems facing the Nigerian economy of today. These problems are Slow growth of the industrial sector with capacity utilization averaging about 3%, high and growing rate of unemployment, slow growth of the agricultural sector, high internal and external debt burden, etc. Self-assessment exercise. What are the major problems of the Nigerian economy that you know? 3.5 some solutions to the Nigerian economy. There is no doubt that over the years, many attempts have been made to address the problems of the Nigerian economy. On agriculture, many policies have been put in place. The most important of these policies are Operation Feed the Nation, OFN, under the military regime of General Olusegun Obasanjo, RTD, and the Green Revolution under the civilian administration of Alhaji Shehu Shagari. Also, many successive administrations have put in place fiscal and monetary policies to address Nigeria's economic problems. In respect of fiscal policy, various administrations have set the following objectives. Reduction of the level of price inflation. Provision of the necessary protection for local industries. Provision of a suitable price incentive framework in favor of increased agricultural and industrial production. Expansion of agriculture and industry. Encouragement of local production of import substituting goods by encouraging local industries with heavy local content. Encouragement of dispersal of industrial location. Discouragement of importation of consumer goods which are available locally in order to curtail the outflow of foreign exchange. Enhancement of government revenue. Moderation of the rate of price inflation. Stimulation of industrial agricultural production. High level of employment. Improvement of balance of payment positions, reduction of foreign indebtedness, and generation of more revenue, especially from the non-oil sector of the economy. You should also remember that to achieve fiscal and monetary objectives mentioned above, governments also put some measures in place such as 1. Reduction of government expenditure with the intention of reducing offensive demand and subsequently checking inflationary pressures. 2. Continuous reorganization and reformation of customs and excise tariff. 3. Encouragement of investment in agriculture through the abolition of duties on machinery for exclusive use in agriculture and subsidizing inputs employed in the sector. 4. Setting credit ceiling for banks and encouraging sectoral distribution of credit. 5. Regulation of the liquidity ratio and cash ratio of commercial banks. 6. Introduction of Compulsory Advanced Deposit Scheme to Restrict Imports In 1986, the Babangida administration decided to modify and extend the previous fiscal and monetary objectives and measures. 
Consequently, the Structural Adjustment Program, SAP, was introduced. It was mainly aimed at 1. Restructuring and diversifying the productive base of the economy with a view to reducing dependence on the oil sector and imports. 2. Achieving fiscal balance and ensuring balance of payments viability. 3. Laying the basis for sustainable and non-inflationary growth. 4. Intensifying private sector growth potential. Self-assessment exercise. Use your own words to state the solutions to the Nigerian economy. 3. 5.1 Sunny Abacha 2010 Vision On 27th of November 1996, General Sunny Abacha inaugurated what he called 2010 Vision. The intention of the 2010 Vision was to embrace and institutionalize a culture of long-term planning. It is arguable now that the Achilles' heel of the Nigerian economy is not the lack of policy designs, but rather their implementation. Also, new administrations should learn to carry out viable policies set by their predecessors. Discontinuity in policymaking constitutes a serious blow to any economy. Self-assessment exercise. What was the aim of Abacha's 2010 vision? 4.0 Conclusion. This study unit has dealt with the analysis and understanding of the relationship between economy and national development in Nigeria before and after independence. 5.0 Summary. In this study unit, I introduced you to the analysis and understanding of the relationship between economy and national development in Nigeria. Therefore, at the end of this unit, you are expected to 1. Describe the historical tie between economy and national development in Nigeria. 2. Discuss the Nigerian economic system before and after independence. 3. Evaluate the Nigerian economic system of today, etc. 6.0 Tutor Marked Assignment when can we say a country is self-reliant? Do well to share with others as well as on your study groups. Unit 3. A Historical Analysis of Religion and National Development in Nigeria. 1.0 Introduction. This unit introduces you to the historical relationship between religion and national development in Nigeria from pre-colonial times till date. 2.0 Objectives. At the end of this unit, you should be able to 1. Explain what religion actually means. 2. Describe the historical tie between religion and national development in Nigeria before and after independence. 3. Evaluate the religion-state relationship in contemporary Nigeria, etc. 3.0 Main Content 3.1. The Role of Religion in Traditional African Society Although the exact origins of religions are unknown, there is no doubt that traditional Africa was ultimately religious in character. In traditional African society, religion permeated the superstructure and the basis of the society. For instance, most of the laws governing traditional African society were religiously based. History tells us that in traditional African society, religion not only provided an explanation of how the African peoples came to be what they were, but also provided the social power by which people could make laws and customs and even ensured that they were respected. Religion helped people to live together in order to express their higher hopes. Therefore, the roles played by religion affected the process and pace of development. Religion also played positive roles in African societies during the pre-colonial era. We can say with confidence that traditional religion contributed to the unity and stability of traditional African societies, and this was a welcome contribution to nation-building. In any African traditional religion, God was considered the almighty legislator, the creator of the universe, who was timeless and who guided and watched over the affairs of every individual from above. In Nigeria, for instance, every community had a name for God. He is called Chiniki in Igboland, Osanobua in Benin, Olodumare or Olorun in Yorubaland, Ubangidi in Hausaland, Abasi in Efik, Per in Ijo country, Ogain in Urhobo and Isokoland. Self-assessment exercise. What role did religion play in traditional African societies? 3. 1.1 God and the lesser gods or goddesses. In almost every traditional society there were lesser gods or goddesses. It was generally held that the Almighty God was too important and remote to concern himself with the affairs of mankind. Thus, any consultation had to pass through the medium of a number of deities and gods or goddesses. As far as Nigeria is concerned, in Yorubaland, for instance, the gods or goddesses were known as Orissas. In Igboland, they were called Ndichi, 
while in Benin they were referred to as Olokun. History tells us that these gods or goddesses had their own priests, prophets and diviners who communicated messages from the people to God and vice versa. Again they existed alongside with a variety of religious cults and oracles. More so, in most traditional African communities, ancestor worship was very common. Even today the belief is still existent. In traditional Africa, ancestors were regarded as living, not dead, and they played a major role in the society. According to Parinder, 1962, everything that concerns the family, its health and fertility, are of interest to the ancestors since they are its elders and will also seek rebirth into the family. The family land is their property and they must be consulted when land is let out to other people. In traditional Africa, there was not a clear-cut demarcation between the functions of the Almighty God and those of the gods or goddesses. They all took care of every aspect of the people's lives. For instance, there was the god of war, of fertility, of water, the sky, of iron, etc. The idea of lesser gods was very strong in traditional African society because of the belief that they acted faster than the Almighty God whom according to them is too merciful. Ooh. Self-assessment exercise. What was the relationship between God and the lesser gods or goddesses in traditional Africa? 3.2 Religion and Social Stability In traditional society, there were no written constitutions at all. They adhered to and believed in an unwritten code of conduct guaranteed by the ancestors and the gods or goddesses. That code of conduct defined the good and the bad conduct in the society. History tells us that the social and cultural organization of traditional African society was embedded in religion. Every performance such as marriage, the naming of a newborn child, birth and death ceremonies, and the age-grade system were religion-related. The fear and respect for the gods and ancestors were a sine qua non. This contributed immensely to the cohesion and maintenance of social and cultural values in the society. In traditional African society, every marriage, for instance, was contracted with the fear of the ancestors and gods. This belief seriously reduced the rate of divorce. History tells us that in traditional Urhobo society, for instance, divorce was uncommon because they believed that since the ancestors had received the drinks and food given them during the marriage ceremony, it was expected to last forever. It is obvious that in traditional Africa, marriages also contributed to the stability in the whole social structure. Moreover, there were no cases of bastard children in traditional African society. Every child born outside wedlock was integrated into the family. There was no police force in the modern sense of the word in traditional Africa. The gods and ancestors were the only regulators of morality and conduct. Secret societies were also considered as very powerful in traditional African society as they contributed immensely to the social stability. In Nigeria, for instance, there were the Ogboni and the Oro in Yoruba land, the Ekpe and the Leopard Society in Cross River, and the Arachukwu in the Igbo country, the Owegbe in Benin, and the Igboze in the Urhoba land. In pre-colonial Africa, secret cults formed an essential part of the native court government. Self-assessment exercise. Did religion contribute to social stability in traditional Nigerian societies? 3.3 Religion and Economic Development You should always remember that religion played very positive roles in the system of production and exchange in pre-colonial Africa. In Nigeria, for instance, almost every factory was established only to satisfy religious needs. For example, carvers were responsible for the production of images of lesser gods and masquerades. Festivals were very frequent in pre-colonial Nigeria. This made carving to become economically very important, especially in the Niger Delta and Igbo land. In these regions, carvers had to carve different kinds of masquerades. Still in Igbo land, the carvers of Umudioka, for instance, became wealthy from the manufacture of ritual objects and insignia such as ceremonial stools, doors, and panels used by titled men. Besides carving, ritual works and sacrifices demanded and increased the products of pottery workers, blacksmiths, weavers, drummers, and farmers as well. In some places such as Yoruba land, iron was so important that it was worshipped. Shango was known as the god of iron. Leatherwork was very important in northern Nigeria. The leather was used for the manufacture of mats and bags used by traditional doctors. 
It was also useful for the manufacture of drums for religious festivals. In Benin, the Oba established the guild system in order to satisfy his religious needs. The standardization of the products and the increase in production led to an accumulation of wealth on the part of the craftsmen. More so, in Nigeria as in any pre-colonial African society, land was deified. Land was believed to be under the guardianship of the gods. Therefore, it was sacred. This religious African attitude towards land seriously influenced the traditional African economic system. Self-assessment exercise Discuss the relationship between religion and economy in pre-colonial Nigeria. 3.4 Religion and Politics In traditional African society, religion and politics were interwoven. At that period, according to Basil Davidson, every African lived in an age of faith like the Europe of the Middle Ages, A.D. 800, 1350. Traditional Africans believed that political authority was an act of God and the spirits. It was beyond human reach. This is evident when you look at the so-called well-established kingdoms and empires which can be regarded as nation-states such as Oyo, Benin, Nupe, Jukun, Kanembornu, and the Hausa. Rulers who combined priestly functions with political power headed all these nation-states. The priest-kings were regarded as representatives of God on earth. They made their people believe that they were supernatural. This is true of the Oba of Benin. There was the belief that the Oba descended from the sky and therefore was divinely ordained to rule the world. This was also the case with the Alephin of Oyo, A.K.U. of Jukun, and Etsu of Nupe. Self-assessment exercise. Discuss the relationship between religion and politics in traditional Nigeria. 3.5 Countdown to Organized Religion in Contemporary Nigeria. You should always remember that before her independence, two organized foreign religions arrived in Nigeria, Christianity and Islam. History tells us that from 1960 onward, almost every Nigerian elite claimed allegiance to either Christianity or Islam. 3. 5.1 State Religion Relationship The intrusion of Christianity and Islam into an independent Nigeria put the country in a complex situation. The supreme law under which the country operated was the Nigerian Independence Constitution of 1960 as amended by the 1963 Republican Constitution. It was very clear from these documents that Nigeria was a secular state, that is, the affairs of state must not be mixed with religion. Religious belief and worship were to remain strictly personal. Unfortunately, this could not hold for a long time. For instance, Nigeria's Second Republic was inaugurated amidst certain fears, especially the fear of religious wars. Nigeria became the battlefield of Christianity and Islam. 3. 5.2. The Maitatsin Riots Kano is best known as the hotbed of the Islamic intellectualism, radicalism, and agitations. From Kano, in 1980, members of the Maitatsin Islamic sect struck, killing and destroying everything in their way. That baptism of religious war has continued to hunt Nigeria as a ghost ever since. Although there have been many other religious conflicts in Nigeria, history tells us that the Maitatsin riots were attempts by an Islamic sect to force its ideas on an unwilling society. This created the feeling that Nigerians are not free to hold different religious views. Therefore, persons from particular parts of the country and adherents of certain faiths felt unwelcome and unsafe in some other parts of Nigeria. It is obvious that such attitudes negatively influenced the process of national integration and development in Nigeria. 3. 5.3 Abuja, home for all. Abuja is Nigeria's new capital city. It was baptized home for all and viewed as a symbol of national unity, However, the challenge between Christianity and Islam led some Nigerian scholars to criticize Abuja's capability to unite the various peoples and faiths of Nigeria. For instance, according to them, the main entrances into Abuja have Islamic and not national symbols. The presidential villa was equipped with a mosque only. With this scenario, the feeling is being created that Nigeria is not a secular state. The letter and spirit of the national constitution are being violated. The usual use of religion as a weapon of winning support from majority of the citizenry by Nigerian rulers, without due regard to the consequences for national psyche, is quite alarming. In 1986, for instance, Ibrahim Babangida attempted to smuggle Nigeria into the Organization of Islamic Conference, OIC, 
without the knowledge of either his armed forces ruling council or his cabinet. Although the attempt failed, it did not stop the feeling of us versus them. Unlike the pre-colonial Nigeria, it is apparent that for modern and contemporary Nigeria, religious cohabitation seems to be a monumental failure. Christianity and Islam as the only viable organized religions have shown themselves incapable of changing the moral tones of the larger society. It is unfortunate to notice that although average Nigerian elite is an adherent of one religion or the other, yet he fails to see the relationship between religious piety and public morality. Hence, the relationship between religion and state in contemporary Nigeria is a paradox. It is common in Nigeria to see that people known to have subverted public morality are sometimes honored with religious titles. Religious groups are eager to receive donations from whosoever without investigating the sources of wealth of the donor, thus making dubiousness an accepted norm. Self-Assessment Exercises In contemporary Nigeria, as for as religion is concerned, what do you know about the Maitatsin riots and Abuja Home for All? 4.0 Conclusion this study unit has dealt with the analysis and understanding of the relationship between religion and national development in Nigeria from pre-colonial times till date. It is clear to you now that the type of relationship between religion and the state in traditional Nigeria is different from what is happening today. 5.0 Summary In this study unit, I introduced you to the analysis and understanding of the relationship between religion and national development in Nigeria from a historical perspective. Therefore, at the end of this unit, you are expected to 1. Explain what religion actually means. 2. Describe the historical ties between religion and national development in Nigeria. 3. Discuss the relationship between religion and national development in Nigeria before and after independence. 4. Evaluate the religion-state relationship in contemporary Nigeria, etc. 6.0 Tutor Marked Assignment the religion-state relationship in traditional Nigeria is different from what is happening today. Discuss. 1.0 Introduction This study unit introduces you to the understanding of ancient and contemporary origins of citizenship, the issue of rights of citizens, the methods or conditions of acquiring citizenship, and duties and obligations of a citizen in Nigeria. 2.0 Objectives At the end this unit you should be able to 1. Explain what citizenship actually means in Nigeria. 2. Discuss the ancient and contemporary origins of citizenship. 3. State the conditions of acquiring citizenship in Nigeria. 4. Explain the difference between political rights and civil liberty. 5. State about rights and obligations of citizens in Nigeria. 3.0 Main Content 3.1 Origins of Citizenship 3. 1.1 Ancient Origins it's very difficult, if not impossible, to trace the origins of citizenship without going back to Greek philosophers. Indeed, Greek philosophers are best known as the systematizers of early scientific thought. In early Athenian society, the concept of citizen was very different from what we know of it today. Plato and Aristotle, for instance, had a strange and unique understanding of citizenship. According to them, a citizen was he who was born into or classified within the penumbra of the ruling class or the aristocratic class, that is, the philosopher king, the guardian and the like. Only this category of people could exercise the right to life, private property, education, leadership, vote, and be voted for, etc. To Plato and Aristotle, anyone outside the foregoing categories was just an ordinary person, someone of low birth or a servant. He did not deserve the status of a citizen. His lifestyle could not go beyond that of an animal. Indeed, he was someone totally imbued with passions instead of reason. 3. 1.2 Contemporary Origins the contemporary origin and understanding of citizenship, different from that of Plato and Aristotle, can be traced to as far back as 1789. The Declaration of the Rights of Man, issued by the National Assembly of France during the French Revolution in 1789, gave a universal and an unbiased dimension to citizenship. We could hear statements such as, Men are born and always continue, free and equal in respect of their rights. Apodori, 1975-86 we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, was also found in the American Declaration of Independence in 1776. 
Self-assessment exercise. Use your own words to discuss the origins of ancient and contemporary citizenship. 3.2. How to become a citizen of a state in Nigeria. According to the Oxford Advanced Dictionary of Current English, a citizen is he that has full rights in a state either by birth or by gaining such rights. While for Okoli and Okoli in a simple language, citizenship means the totality of all rights and privileges accorded to all members of a given state. Okoli and Okoli, 1990-27. In Nigeria, there are at least two ways of acquiring citizenship, namely by birth and by legal process. 3. 2.1 Citizenship by Birth The citizenship by birth is also called just sanguinis. In Nigeria, there are some conditions to fulfill in order to acquire citizenship by birth. I, for instance, all persons born in Nigeria before independence, either of whose parents or any of whose grandparents belong to an indigenous Nigerian community. 2. All persons born in Nigeria after independence, either of whose parents or any of whose grandparents is a Nigerian citizen, are automatically citizens of Nigeria. You should also remember that the citizenship by just sanguinis does not necessarily mean that you must be born within Nigeria. As long as your parents are citizens of Nigeria, it does not matter where you are born in order to acquire citizenship status. However, this is different from the so-called law of soil or place. In the case of the Law of Soil, also called Jossoli, any person born within the territorial jurisdiction of a state is automatically a citizen of that state, irrespective of the citizenship of the parents. This is clearly stated in the 14th Amendment of the United States of America. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. Self-Assessment Exercise what are the conditions for acquiring citizenship in Nigeria? 3. 2.2 Citizenship by Legal Processes Naturalization is the commonest legal mode of acquiring the citizenship of a state. You should know that there are at least three forms of naturalization, namely, direct naturalization. Here, the individual acquires the citizenship of a state after he has fulfilled the prescribed legal prerequisites as determined by that state. In Nigeria's case, for instance, an applicant must be resident in the country for a continuous period of 15 years, or for at least 15 of non-continuous 20 years, including 12 consecutive months immediately preceding application to the President for the grant of Certificate of Naturalization. Besides, the applicant must be able to contribute to the growth or advancement of Nigeria, must be of age and capacity, and must be of good character and wishes to be domiciled in Nigeria. Furthermore, the person must satisfy the governor of the state of residency that he or she is acceptable to the immediate community and has indeed been assimilated into its norms, values, etc. Derivative naturalization. This simply means that a spouse or a child becomes or acquires citizenship status as a result of the parents, spouses, or relatives' direct naturalization. Collective naturalization. In this case, a group of people occupying a defined territory acquires the citizenship privileges of another, either by treaty or by statute, annexing the territory to a new one. 3.3 Rights and Privileges of Citizens You should know that in any state, the individual must have his rights and privileges as well. Civil liberty is an aggregate of the rights recognized by the state. Gettel, according to Apadori, 1975, contends that civil liberty consists of the rights and privileges which the state creates and protects for its citizens. According to Okoli and Okoli, 1990, the most important of these rights and privileges that citizens of any state enjoy can be grouped into two, namely, political rights and civil rights. 1. Political rights. Here every adult citizen, for instance, is entitled to vote or be voted for in any election, unless and until he is disqualified by competent authority of the state. 2. Civil rights. These are rights that inhere in the individual, and they must, ipso facto, be protected by the basic law or the constitution, and indeed, the legal process of the state. These are rights to life, dignity of human person, personal liberty, fair hearing, freedom of thought, private and family life, peaceful assembly and association, freedom of movement, and freedom from discrimination. Self-assessment exercise. In your own words, state the rights of citizens in Nigeria. 3.4 Obligations of Citizens. 
As stated earlier, besides the rights and privileges the individual enjoys as a member of the state, he also has some obligations vis-à-vis -vis the state. These obligations can be summarized as follows. 1. A citizen is expected to place the interest of the state before any other interest. 2. A citizen must pay his tax promptly. 3. A citizen must obey the laws of the state. 4. A citizen must defense of the state against internal and external enemies. 5. A citizen must uphold the honor and dignity of the state. And 6. A citizen must respect the symbol and symbolism of the state. Self-assessment exercise. What are the obligations of citizens in Nigeria? 4.0 Conclusion This study unit has dealt with the issue of rights and obligations of citizens, the ancient and contemporary understanding of citizenship, and the methods of acquiring citizenship in Nigeria. 5.0 Summary In this unit, I introduced you to the ancient and contemporary origins of citizenship, the rights of citizens, the methods or conditions of acquiring citizenship, and the duties and obligations of citizens in Nigeria. Therefore, at the end of this unit, you are expected to 1. Explain what citizenship actually means in Nigeria. 2. Discuss the ancient and contemporary origins of citizenship. 3. State about the conditions of acquiring citizenship in Nigeria. 4. Identify the difference between political rights and civil liberty. 5. State fundamental rights and obligations of citizen in Nigeria, etc. 6.0 Tutor Marked Assignment Who is called a citizen in a Nigerian state? Justice and National Development in Nigeria 1.0 Introduction This study unit introduces you to the understanding of social justice in Nigeria. It focuses mainly on the historical perspective. 2.0 Objectives At the end of this unit, you should be able to 1. Know what social justice actually means. 2. Understand the relationship between social justice and human rights. 3. Discuss the relationship between social justice and national development. 4. Know if social injustice is a permanent condition or can be eradicated, etc. 3.0. Main content. 3.1. Justice and social justice. Justice is not a simple word, it is a way of life as well. In English, for instance, the word justice is mostly limited to its judicial and administrative contexts, while in ancient Greece, justice was something more than that. Apart from the administrative and the judicial usages, justice has an ethical meaning as well, Orieso, 1996-29. For Greek philosophers and thinkers, justice was equated with morality. For Socrates and especially Plato, justice is a part of human virtue. It made man to be good. Accordingly to Plato, justice was one of the virtues apart from wisdom, courage, and temperance that made a good individual. In Plato's thought, justice was designed for the amicable relationship of man in society. Consequently, social justice was seen as restraint on the individual's capacities from doing things that lacked virtue or that made him a bad person. Simply put, Social justice was the quality which men possessed that enabled them to enter into potential relation with each other. You should also remember that the term social justice was synonymous with human rights. Self-assessment exercise. What does social justice mean to you? 3.2 Individual and Social Justice in Nigeria. You should remember that every country or nation is an aggregation of individuals. But the individual, being the sole creative and the prime mover in all activities, is considered a vital key to human development. Since the end result of every country or nation is general harmony then, the individual must impose some degree of restraint on himself for the country to achieve the needed harmony. He must allow his ability to be regulated by law. In Plato's understanding, for instance, the rules that make society possible also make men good. Social justice is the cornerstone of other virtues of the state. Without social justice, the state cannot be harmonious. You should know that in Nigeria there is yet no general harmony. There is no check and balance between the individual and the state. In the Nigerian context, some conditions need to be fulfilled. Full employment for all citizens. 1. A national minimum wage compatible with decent living and economic well-being. 2. Free education at all levels. 3. Modernization of agriculture. 4. Rapid industrialization. 5. Improvement in infrastructural facilities. 6. 
a comprehensive social insurance scheme, and etc. It is only under these conditions that the individual as the sole creative and propelling force of development could be optimized. Self-assessment exercise. Discuss the relationship between social justice and the individual in Nigeria. 3.3 Development and Social Justice in Nigeria. You should remember that the concept of development does not have a universal definition. Each scholar defines it according to his school of thought. In this section, development will refer to a change or a transformation into a better state. In this way, you see that development is a process. As stated earlier, social justice and human rights are interrelated. The question of development and human rights are being tackled both at the international and national levels. At the international level, with the adoption of the African Charter, there is now an African perspective to human rights or social justice. But you should also know that the African Charter or UN Commission on Human Rights cannot effectively enforce measures against human rights violations. It is only at the national level that this can be effectively done. Every nation must consider the right to development as an inalienable human right, and so the violation of the right to development must be considered as a serious social injustice. Besides, you should always remember that for now, the African continent has the highest concentration of the least developed nations of the world. This is much disturbing as well as challenging. Self-assessment exercise. Can we talk about development without social justice? 3.4 Social Justice and National Development in Nigeria Historically, the problem of social justice in Nigeria can be traced back to the first amalgamation of 1914. It is recorded that since that period, the Nigerian experience with social justice has never been a pleasant one at all. Nigerian people have been suffering from oppression and repression ever since. The post-independence era represents another period. You should know that even after the official handover of power in 1960, social injustice did not stop in Nigeria. Till date, the question of social injustice is so glaring because Nigeria as a country is still characterized by unbalanced units of the Federation. 1. Gross incapacity and utter lack of honesty and comprehension on the part of those who direct the affairs of the federal government. Two. Tenacity of power, that is, an overpowering and obsessive desire on the part of our political leaders to stick indefinitely to public office by all means, fair or foul. 3. Promulgation of unjust laws by undemocratic regimes. 4. Travesty on the rights of individuals. For example, unnecessary detention of members of opposition groups without trials. 5. Discrimination in allocation of resources amongst the states of the Federation. 6. Inequality of rights and privileges. 7. High degree of corruption, high spate of poverty, unemployment, and so on. However, you should also know that social injustice is not a permanent condition. It cannot reign forever. Therefore, it is possible to reverse the policy of social injustice, which seems to be a permanent feature in Nigeria. This can be done only and only if the Nigerian government is ready to listen to all shades of opinion because vox populi vox di, that is the people's voice, is God's voice as well. Self-assessment exercise. Discuss the relationship between social justice and national development in Nigeria. 4.0 Conclusion. This study unit dealt with the relationship between social justice and national development in Nigeria. It is clear to you now that although social injustice has been reigning in Nigeria before and after independence, it is not a permanent condition. Social injustice can be eradicated in Nigeria. 5.0 Summary In this study unit, I introduced you to the relationship between social justice and national development in Nigeria. I also discussed the relationship between social justice and human rights. Therefore, at the end of this unit, you should be able to 1. Know the relationship between social justice and national development in Nigeria. 2. Understand what social justice actually means. 3. Know the relationship between social justice and human rights. And 4. Know if social injustice in a country like Nigeria can be eradicated, etc. 6.0 Tutor Marked Assignment Is it possible to eradicate social injustice in a country like Nigeria? 6.0 